Hola. <risa> Bienvenidos. ¿Cómo está? Unfortunately, that's all the Spanish I know. <laughs> so I'll have to stop there. How many here are native Spanish speakers? <laughs> I know. All right. <laughs> Better? Yeah. All right, so I will speak in English, but I'll put the slides in Spanish. Is that okay? All right, very good. All right, so I'd like to welcome you to to uh, design for trusted companies. And uh, just to uh, introduce myself a little bit more, as, as uh, we discussed, I was uh, on the Windows Server team and also the Windows Vista and the Windows 7 team as well at Microsoft. In case it matters, I do want to point out I was not on the Windows 8 team. <laughs> so, I can't explain to you. Uh, but uh, one thing I do want to point out about my, my work at Microsoft, and it's the reason I'm presenting this to you today, is that Microsoft had the security, Secure Soft Computing Initiative in 2002, where they literally shut the company down for two weeks because of the Nunda, Nunda and Code Red and the various uh, security problems that they were having. And so they assembled a variety of teams to work on a variety of issues. And since I was uh, the uh, user interface program manager for security UI on Windows Server, I was uh, responsible for some work in, in uh, designing guidelines for trust with respect to uh, security and privacy. So I worked on these guidelines and I worked on a training course. It was very successful. But the one thing I realized was that security and uh, designing for trust uh, and confidence applies pretty much to all UI. It's not just about security, it's not just about privacy. It really applies to everything. So what I'm going to present to you today is kind of my broad thinking about uh, what you need to inspire confidence and trust. So I do want to point out that I have a new book. It's called uh, uh, UI is communication, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give away a free copy at the end, and we're going to give it to the person who asks the best question. <laughs> so let's make sure that we ask the good questions at the end. So uh, my agenda today, so I want, want to just talk about two topics here. First of all, I do want to talk about the motivation of why this is important, but I also want to talk about earning trust and also building confidence. And so let's start with the motivation. Why do we care about this? Well, uh, usually what we tend to do in, a, in UI a lot is focus on mechanical solutions, kind of like with the ability to get tasks done in our UI. But users need other things, right? They need to, to know what they can do, so is it useful? They need to know uh, if it will do what they want, so is it usable? And we need to know if it's done what users want and have they done the task correctly. So we need other things above and beyond the mechanical ability to get tasks done. And you're probably familiar with uh, all the useful, usable, desirable idea and also Maslow's pyramid of needs. And so the interesting thing is at the bottom of the pyramid, the bottom of the, of the pyramid here is more focused on useful. Can it do something useful? Does it have mechanical usability? The middle of the pyramid is more about usable. Can users actually get tasks done? That sort of thing. But the top of the pyramid, these are things that we very often don't think about. We don't think about making the experience fun or engaging or personal. We don't think about making it trustworthy or inspiring confidence. And that's what I want to address. One observation I want to make is that we should not take the user's trust for confidence. We do this all the time. We assume that users trust us, but they don't. We have to earn that trust. We have to go out of our way to earn it. And if we don't earn that trust, nothing else matters because people won't trust their software. They will. <coughs> so I just want to give you a very simple example. Let's suppose you're visiting an unfamiliar city. Let's say you're a visitor to Buenos Aires, and you ask someone for directions. So think about how that works. You actually are doing kind of two things when you ask for directions. You're paying attention to the directions, what is the person telling you, but you're also assessing whether or not that person is credible. Do they really know what they're talking about? And if you decide at some point that they don't know what they're talking about, you're probably going to be very polite, you'll nod your head, but at that point you're going to stop paying attention because you just don't care. You don't trust the directions because the person doesn't know what they're talking about. And so you don't care what their response is. And I think software is very similar to that. If we don't trust it, we won't use it. So when I was on the Windows team, there was a guy named L.L. Cooperman, and he used to like to ask the question, what would you rather do with your photo collection? Would you rather store it on a Windows computer 
or store your photo collection in a gasoline-soaked cardboard box? Yes. <laughs> and the interesting thing about that question is it's a good question. You actually have to think about it. It's like, well, you know, <laughs> as long as nobody has a match, <laughs> my photos are going to be there tomorrow if I put them in a gasoline-soaked cardboard box. However, on my Windows computer, who knows? I don't know about you, but personally, I did lose my photo collection once on my computer. It's just, if it's gone, where did it go? I have no idea. I think it was a sync. It's either Apple or Zoom, probably. One of these sync things decided I didn't want my photos anymore, and it just moved. And I was surprised. By that. Unfortunately, I had them backed up, so it wasn't a problem. All right, so uh, what I want to suggest here is if you have a product or a feature that you think is really, really well designed, but people aren't using it the way you expect them to, there's a very good chance that perhaps they don't trust it enough, or they don't have enough confidence. So that's what is important. Don't trust the product. A gasoline soaked cardboard box actually works for you. All right, so let's talk a little bit about trust. This is something we have to earn. My definition of trust is that trust is a relationship that is earned by consistently demonstrating confident, open, Respectful, honest behavior where someone is willing to rely upon or take risks with something or someone. So, stress the key things. This is something we have to earn. We have to earn it by the way in which we do our tasks so that people feel good about us and we're willing to take risks with us. If we fail to do that, we've got a problem. So, why do you care? Well, trust is required for a lot of tasks. It's surprising how many tasks there are that require trust. And if we don't have that trust, People won't perform the task, nothing else really happens. So we have to earn it. We have to, uh, earning in one area does not necessarily mean that we've earned it in other areas. So, for example, I might trust you to mow my lawn, that does not necessarily mean I trust you to take care of your kids. A different amount of trust is required. Uh, the more competence required to do a task, the more trust is required. You have to earn if you're going to manage my finances. I have to really trust you. That's a very important thing. And of course, we should never take this for granted. So, I want to suggest that every task potentially requires trust. And so to give you an idea of this, I wanted to come up with the simplest idea, the simplest UI that requires trust. And here it is. So this is the print options dialog, of course. So the idea is I'm going to print the document. But very often I'm in a situation where I want to print the, the, the current page of my current document. I want to print the current page. So a lot of UIs look like this. And notice there's a current page option here. One thing I noticed, though, is that I never use this option. I never use it. Why do you suppose that is? Am I crazy, or is there something going on here? When, why do you suppose I don't use it? No, I want to print the current page. I want to print the current page. OK. Right, exactly. I have to trust that, in this case, Windows thinks that the current page is the same page that I think the current page is. <laughs> and if it's wrong, I'm going to be upset. Upset. <laughs> Both literally and figuratively. Yeah. Very good. Uh, however, I do notice there are other UIs where I use that feature all the time. I've got the ability to print the current page, and I use it just fine. Don't even give it a second thought. Why do you suppose that is? Because I can see the page. Here it is, right? So, you know, I don't consider this some fancy preview feature. I consider this to be a feature that earns the user's trust. I can trust this. I know what I'm going to get. I'm going to be satisfied with the result. Here, it's taking my trust for granted. Now, what's at stake here? A single piece of paper, maybe a minute of my time, not that big of a deal. So let's look at another example that's a little bit more significant. How about carbon monoxide detectors or smoke detectors? Now, it happens in my house. I've got built-in carbon monoxide detectors. And it turns out that when the detector goes off because there's carbon monoxide, it sounds exactly the same as when it has no battery. <laughs> right? So now let's work this through with a scenario. So let's say we're in bed. It's usually like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. when these things go off. Right? So it's 4 a.m., this thing goes off. <laughs> what do we do? Do we run out of the house and call the fire department at 3 a.m. to make sure that there really is no problem with carbon monoxide, or do we say, oh, maybe it's the battery and we go back to sleep? <laughs> Risk, risking the possibility of waking up dead. Right? How do we know? <coughs> this is a big deal, right? So I notice that this design here does not earn my trust because I have no idea if it's a false alarm or a real alarm. However, note that this 
this feedback here, this LCD display that's telling me the level of carbon monoxide enables me to earn the trust, right? If I see a number in there, I'm going, oh crap, let's get out, we've got a problem. Again, earning trust versus typically. All right, so, uh, let's see. So, uh, uh, trust requires confidence. If we don't look confident, we're not gonna earn that trust. So let's say we've got uh, this particular device. We've got an iPhone and it's telling us 20% of our battery is remaining. How much battery do you suppose is remaining? Got a trick question. It's probably around 20%. I mean, the, the amazing thing on the iPhone is if you have 1%, you still have time. You can actually get something done. All right, how about this? Windows is telling us that 21 minutes or 10% of our battery is remaining. How much battery is remaining? Five minutes. Not 21 minutes or 10%. You gotta go and you gotta get your recharger right now. This is shutting down, right? So which one is trustworthy? Which one is not? What is the least trustworthy feature of the iPhone? At least my personal opinion. What do you suppose I would have to do? Pardon? Signal off, perhaps. Well, I'm actually, I'm thinking about the spell correction. All right, so here's an example. Do you want to go to Zimbabwe today? When I say that Zimbabwe, I actually mean Zuma, a stupid phone. So there's whole websites with stupid error corrections. Here's another one, I have lesbian errors. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here's a situation where uh, I'm trying to print something and my network printer shows up as offline. And I have to use Windows. <coughs> and uh, so uh, here's what I see on the screen. So remember, trust requires confidence. So let's see, I've got a state that seems to be good. I've got a warning. And I've got an error. <laughs> so I get to choose. Which one of those I believe is it a warning, is an error, is it a, is it a <laughs> Then I uh, run the troubleshooter and it says to contact my network administrator. So I'm doing this at home. As it happens, I am my network administrator. So <laughs> I contacted myself and I didn't. <laughs> and then I go to the help. So here's the help. So I'm looking for network printer offline. Look at the various help topics. I can access files and printers. This is helpful. This is earn your trust. Do you feel like Windows is going to help you solve this problem? There's nothing here to build our trust, is there? This is pretty simple. All right, so these are things that earn our trust. So we want to have confidence in the reputation of our counterparty. So who are we working with? Will we trust that counterparty? Will we have confidence in the task? What is it we're doing? How about the task options and defaults? Sometimes we see defaults that don't look like they're good for us, that looks like they're good for somebody else. That does not earn our trust. We want to have control over the terms. We want to have control over privacy, security. We want to make sure that we don't lose anything, that we don't get embarrassed. Things like clarity and transparency and feedback will go very long way in order to achieve. All right, so here's a real UI from Windows Vista. So they're asking us if we'd like to join the Windows Computer Experience Improvement Program. What do you think? Trustworthy? Why not? What is it about this that doesn't look quite good? Your tape button. Okay. So if you're like me, the thing you're probably reacting to is this. That OK button was disabled, right? What's going on? So I told this joke in Europe, nobody laughed, but uh, it's like a, a uh, Russian election, right? You know, are you voting for Putin now? Or are you voting for Putin later? It doesn't really look like we have a choice, does it? So what's going on here? Uh, so uh, what's going on here actually includes this little shield. Does that mean anything to anybody? Exactly. So, the, so uh, that security shield is telling us that it's going to present the user account prompt, the UHC prompt. So it's going to ask us if we really want to do that thing, right? So what's going on here is that they really tried to get rid of as many of those as they possibly could. So as it happens, 
we are not in the program. And so if we were to click OK, they would present this dialogue asking us to, uh, to, to say if we really want to make this change when there is no change to make. This is what we already have. So the idea was to disable this. So if you click cancel, you would in fact not be in the program. Who's going to know that other than the people who designed this feature? Doesn't this look like you're trying to be tricked into something you don't want to do, right? That's what it looks like. This does not earn our trust. Even though it's not malicious and it was not bad intention, it doesn't look that way. Right? All right, how about this? So I talked about photos before. So let's say we got a situation where we're importing photos from our camera to our computer, and let's say for the sake of argument, we want to replace the photos after we've done that. What do you think? Is this trustworthy? So would anybody check that? Why not? You don't know what you're raising. Right, so if Windows isn't smart enough to know how much battery it has, or whether or the reason why a printer is offline, what's going to make us think that if there's any kind of problem, that it won't do this, some stupid thing and erase our photos without copying it, right? Yeah. Right, isn't that possible? So I want to see something like, don't worry, we won't erase any files until we verify that it's been successfully copied, something a little bit short of that. But that's what I want to see in order to have copy. This takes it for granted, because of course it's going to work just fine, isn't it? Right. So, uh, these are things that lose users' trust. Of course, the opposite of those things that I just talked about. Things like uh, surprises, bad deals, not keeping promises, inappropriate use of our personal information, perception of change after the deal is done, satisfaction not guaranteed, complexity of the complex legal statements in terms of so, satisfaction guarantee. I can tell you, if I don't totally have confidence in certain counterparties, having a money back guarantee really does give me confidence to try a service for somebody I don't know. I feel good about certain companies, Amazon, I don't need this, but for the smaller companies where I don't really have a relationship, this is important, especially uh, if I'm paying a lot of money. All right, uh, does this UI inspire confidence here? So, uh, I live in Vermont. Uh, Orbis is a Vermont company. I have many Orbis products. I got an email from Orbis saying that they had a special where I could buy a product and get free shipping. Right, so here I am, and this might be hard to read, but it says shipping method for five to seven business days or nine. So, is this trustworthy? What do you suppose I'm going to do? Am I getting free shipping? It sure doesn't look like it, does it? Now note there's a, a red thing here that says uh, free standard shipping, so it's promising free shipping, but I don't see free shipping. So the way this is designed, I expect to see free shipping here. I expect to see free, right? That's what I expect to see. As it happens, what I have to do is complete the task and get all the way to the very end. And at the very end, yes, in fact, I get free shipping. But my question is, who's going to go all the way to the end if we don't have the trust and we're getting the deal more often? We're not going to do it, are we? We're going to bail out. It's like, what's going on? Why am I not getting the future? All right, so here's, I like to make models for things. So here's my, my model for trust. So basically, users want to get their work done. They want to achieve their goals. And so what they're doing, as they're doing this, is they're kind of looking for signs, for clues, whether or not you're trustworthy. So if they see things that look encouraging, everything's good. But once we get to the point where we kind of lack that confidence, we're going to give up. We think we're going to maybe I should do this. All right. So my, my law of, my, of trust is that trust is hard to hard to earn, but it's very easy to lose and very difficult to get back once we've lost it. So what's not? All right. It turns out that that Google has a fantastic set of principles for trust, so I just wanted to share this with you. I don't know if you look very familiar at this point. We've covered a lot of things, but uh, we want to uh, learn trust in good design. I mentioned confidence before, so that's really important. We want designs that are efficient and professional and make actions easily reversible. Transparency is very important. We want to know what we're getting. We don't want to be surprised. And also, of course, Google sells ads and those things with personal information. So that's very important to them. Which is in fact that that requires trust. Right, here's an example from Amazon that I find interesting. Now, I was trying to figure out if uh, Amazon does business here in Argentina. Do you, they do? Okay. So there's not a. 
Yeah. All right, so here's an interesting example. So the, basically the deal is I'm asking Amazon to ship a product to a new address one that I've never used before for this account. So it's asking me to enter my full credit card number. And they have this why this is safe link here. And what I found interesting about this is that I felt very reassured by the fact that they were willing to answer that question. I didn't even actually push it on Just the fact that they were willing to tell me why it was safe it gave me that assurance that it would be safe. So I like that. Right, I don't want to talk a little bit about confidence. So confidence is a little bit different than trust. I'm defining it as an emotion that we have. So uh, what is confidence? Well, it's a feeling that users have when they believe they're doing the right thing and that their goals are being satisfied. So a good question to ask is, well, what exactly is the difference? Now, in English, trust and confidence are kind of synonyms. They kind of come from the same Latin root, which is confidere, and it kind of means the same thing. But I'm drawing a distinction between my Spanish and my deck of music. Yeah. We'll use a quick one that I did that, and confidence. So I'm using slightly different words here. But the difference to me is trust is how I feel about you. Confidence is how I feel about me. Am I, am I able to do the task? That's confidence. I need to build my confidence so I feel good about it. Whereas by contrast, trust is how I feel about the counterpart. So I'm defining these to be different things. So we talked about trust previously. I don't talk about confidence now. All right, so uh, things that build confidence. So we want to be able to have confidence that we know what we're going to get and we're going to get it. We want to make sure that we're in the right place. Very often in UI, we're like trying to get something done, we don't even know if we're on the right screen. I want you to build my confidence that I'm in the right place. Let's not take that. All right, I want to make an informed, appropriate decision. So you're asking me a question, give me the information I need in order to make a good decision. Don't just give me the answers. To make, help me choose. Give me the information I need to build my confidence in my choice. Let's see. Uh, I want to have it the terms I want. I want it to be very easy to fix mistakes. People make mistakes all the time. If I make a mistake, are you going to punish me, spank me for doing a wrong, or are you going to help me get back in track? Uh, I want to make sure that uh, we can clearly, easily do all of the above, and let's not take profits. All right, so let's, uh, let's look at it. Uh, my favorite examples for this. Let's say I've got a very early meeting, or maybe a very early flight, and I want to set an alarm using my phone, right? How many ways can I screw that up? <laughs> screw up, it translates well in Spanish. Um, yeah, how many, so give me a couple. Okay, very good, AM with PM, what else? Oh, that's a great one, Black, right? Low battery or maybe the volume off, that's a good one too. Yeah. Wrong day? Wrong day, yes, very good. Okay, very good. All right, so let's say I want to uh, I want to get a very early tomorrow at six at least. Okay, so yeah, tomorrow. All right, is this uh, is this right? Okay, right. come and say. All right, how about here? So this is on my Android phone. Did I get it right? How about here? Did I get it right? No, I didn't. Did you see the difference between the two? Isn't it obvious? It's very easy to make a mistake with the iOS phone, right? If, if you're like me, you probably put PM instead of AM by accident because it's so easy to touch that accidentally, right? It's very easy to miss the day of the week. Whereas by contrast, this extra feedback builds my confidence. So I've got the background, and I also have this bit here. It's telling me when the alarm is going to go off. I can easily look at that and say, wait, that's not right. Whereas by contrast, in the iOS one, I have to like double check it, triple check it, it's just rather than not totally sure. Right, so this one builds my confidence on that. Okay, let's look at calculators. Is this the right answer? Not totally sure. How about this? Is this the right answer? Yeah, it is. I can look at the, the input. Yes, this is in fact the calculation I expected to do. That's the right answer. So having that information again builds my confidence. I can trust the results of this one. This one I have to double check. All right. So, uh, so in the U.S. we have StubHub. Do you have StubHub? Interesting. So maybe that this is to buy tickets for concerts, sporting events. Oh yeah. 
Right. Okay, so similar sort of thing. So uh, one thing I find, I, I don't buy a lot of tickets from StubHub, but I've done it a couple of times, and what I find interesting about it is how far they go out of their way to build your confidence. Everything about their design is about building confidence. So among the things they do is that when you're choosing seats, they give you a preview of what it is you're going to see from that seat. So you have a good seat? Well, I guess. Um, but that is how, I will not be surprised. I will not be disappointed because they're building my confidence. You're going to do this. And if you look at StubHub, the way it's designed, it's just all about that. You're going to enjoy the, the event you're going to. You're going to get a good deal. You're going to get exactly what you expect. You do everything you possibly can to build your confidence. Yes, you want to like what you're doing. Right, so I travel a lot. I look for this sort of thing with flights. So uh, is this building my confidence? Do you see any de design elements in this particular page that's pointing out building my confidence that this is the flight I think I've got? What do you see? Well, that really indicates some kind of error, right? So we've got this bit here. So the interesting thing is I'm flying to Dublin, but I'm leaving from London. So that's a little bit unusual. They're pointing that out. Making sure I really want to do that, right? What else? Right. So this bit here, and also they give me the arrival date. Yes. Right. So this plus this builds my confidence. I'm not gonna be surprised when I arrive. Uh, a small detail I'll show you right off the bat, though, is they do give the day of the week. When I'm looking at reservations, I don't really want to see that. You know, what day am I flying out? Friday? Okay, that's the right day. It doesn't have the Friday. I have to look it up in the calendar. Right? Any details like that? Is there any others? Here. The which one? Yeah. Right. So we're not part of the government. <coughs> Okay, very good. So total time and also the breakdowns and also the layover. So I, I don't want the layover to be too short. I don't want it to be too long. So that helps. And uh, just one more, you know, best price guarantee. That's nice. So these little details really build my confidence. Yes, I can buy this ticket. This is the thing I need to do. I like it. All right, so things that build confidence. Well, I think we just talked about trust. But also other things. All right? We want to make sure that the tasks are well explained, things that we understand. We want to make sure we're making informed decisions. Good defaults help a lot when we're making informed decisions. Because if I know what most people will like or what I'm most likely going to want, then it really, really helps me. Good feedback, clear feedback, transparency. Uh, redundant help, we saw that with the alarm. So that little bit of redundancy goes a long way in really on help on my confidence level. And also uh, allowing users to control what they so I think Google has some interesting guidelines here. One of my favorite guidelines from Google is decide for me, but let me have the final say. I like that. So what they try to do is they try to do the right thing for you automatically. If you don't like it, you can easily get out of it. I like that. So they'll show things like, OK, we're swiping here, so I'm going to delete that item. You never really need to do it. You really do want to do that. So here we have a situation where it's probably an NLC kind of situation. So if you really want to deem something, well, they're going to ask you. So how do we, uh, we need forgiveness, all right? So users make small mistakes all the time. Believe it or not, we're constantly making really tiny mistakes. So what happens when we make a small mistake? <clears throat> well, of course, the best solution is to prevent the problem in the first place. A lot of well-designed ones do that. The next best thing is to uh, help users find the problem, make it easy to correct. The worst thing is to make it hard to find the problem and make, it's not the worst, the second the worst, is uh, make it hard to find the problem and have users start the over. Now, this is something I'm very sensitive to. You'd be amazed how often you have to start completely over whenever you do a task incorrectly. You make a tiny mistake, you have to start completely over. This happens all the time. We do this all the time. I don't like that. The worst thing you could possibly do, though, of course, is make users regret. But, so let's look at a few examples of forgiveness. So uh, I find that the experience in signing into a website or some sort of app is usually horrible. Very poorly designed, and we don't really put a tremendous amount of thought into it. So here we have a situation where I entered in my, my credentials incorrectly. Maybe my username is wrong. Maybe my password is wrong. What specifically did I get wrong? 
no idea whatsoever, right? So I have different usernames that I use for you know, personal versus business. Maybe I type my password in wrong. I could just have a wrong account name. Maybe I have a typo. I don't know. But the fact that they cleared it on error means I have to start completely over and I have no idea what I did wrong the first time you are. No idea at all. And this is especially bad in mobile because quite frankly the last thing I want to do on a mobile phone or a tablet is type this crap over and over and over again. Just leave it there, let me fix it please. All right, here's a good example. So what's interesting here is that uh, there's a lot of situations where, you know, that, like Amazon, I use Amazon all the time. I know that I'm going to account like that. Some websites, I'm not totally sure. In fact, I used Ticketmaster the other day. I don't know if I got an account with those guys. So the interesting thing is I see that better designed websites, they don't assume you know. So if you try to log in and you don't have an account, they'll help you create an account. By contrast, if you're trying to create an account, you already have one, rather than making you start over, they'll log you in. That's very nice. It's not assuming that you need to know the credentials for what you want to <coughs> Here I'm trying to make a travel reservation, and I believe what happened is I got my daughter's age well, and this is like, oh, I don't have to deal with that at the airport, so I have to go back and fix it. When they say new search, they mean new search. You have to start completely over. It's hard. By contrast, I see Expedia they're making it very, very easy to correct small problems. I like that. It's much better. All right, I think it's very important to have a confident, encouraging tone. It's not just the mechanics of it, it's how we feel about it. It's very much an emotional reaction to what it is we're doing. So we want to have good language. Google has the uh, guideline of sprinkle encouragement. Again, I really like that. Sprinkle encouragement. Let's encourage our users to get a task done. And this is important to do, especially with error messages. You might have noticed that the error message language that we use is usually very harsh. We use words like error, failure, illegal, Abort, <laughs> kill, terminate, <laughs> catastrophic, and fatal. Why do we do this? Is it really necessary to use that language? Does that inspire me? Does that make me feel confident? I don't think so. Oh, sorry. All right, so here's a situation where I'm using a product from my HP to, to back up my hard disk. Is this encouraging? <laughs> It's a sprinkling encouragement. <laughs> so what's going on here, by the way, is I know exactly what's going on here because I know this stuff. But uh, it turns out that uh, it's it's failing on Outlook. So Outlook has this OST file thing that is always open, and so when it tries to copy, it just can't deal with it. So I've got one file that did not copy and is never going to copy unless I shut down Outlook. Nevertheless, how do you think this makes you feel? When you see this? Yeah, I guess it didn't work, did it? It's failure. It's failure. <laughs> yeah. You like that? The problem is just the light of the air before Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. Um, so how about this one? So here I'm ordering a, a product on Staples, and I've got a little small mistake. I did not provide any time for me. Spires conference. So, I don't think so, right? So this is not a confidence inspiring. So we've got this cultish, satanic, <laughs> biohazard icon. We've got a big red error. Just to make sure it's clear, we've made some sort of horrible mistake. Right? It really kind of overemphasizes the very small problem. It doesn't make this feel like a All right. So uh, does anyone use personas? Yes, okay, very good. So uh, if you're using personas and you've got a situation that requires trust or confidence, I think there's something to be said for putting that into your persona. So let's say we're coming up with a persona for someone who's thinking about making a travel reservation. Things I'd like to know is what would discourage that user from completing the task, even if they did it correctly? And let's go out of our way to design for that. Put those elements in the persona so we know what that person is looking for. So some things we might have is, you know, let's have that day of the week, or if we have that usual reservation like we looked at before. The 24-hour cancellation policy is very, very good to have. Without having the lowest price fare kind of builds my confidence that I've chosen a good flight. Uh, there might be kind of like hidden things like baggage or fees for seats, that sort of thing, making that obvious so I can discover that after it's too late. 
um, cancellation or change policy, make that obvious before purchase. Those are things we might, we might want to design into our product so that that person has confidence they're actually going to complete the task rather than be unconfident and bailing out before they make the purchase. So let's actually put some thought into that in our personal I think more will better All right. All right, so the thing I want to uh, remind you is that many tasks require trust and confidence. Trust is a relationship that we have to earn. Uh, by contrast, confidence is more of an emotion where we believe we're doing the right thing for ourselves. We should take neither of these when we are ready. We have to earn these. We have to make sure that we have design elements that people use their opportunity to that way to do the right thing. I've got a few resources here if you're interested in uh, this. A uh, friend of mine is uh, Chris Goddard. He wrote a people by design. I think it's a fantastic book by the way. I'm not if you're interested, but uh, that's an excellent resource. A few others, persuasive technology, uh, selective interaction, the secrets of uh, science of persuasion, and several, seven principles in your website. And I just wanted to give a quick uh, blurb about me. So. Uh, that UX design is so, again, I do training and consulting services primarily to software teams that don't have sufficient design talent. Um, I would be happy if you're in a situation where you'd like to get some feedback on the design, I would do the same thing. I do a lot. I've got my contact information here. If you'd like to get in touch with me, feel free to do that. Also, I'd uh, love to, uh, to yeah, get in touch if you'd like to connect with LinkedIn. Right, so, <laughs> question. So here's the thing, we've got something very important on the line here. So we've got a free book here, so. No pressure, right? Yeah, no pressure. <laughs> so, and I'm not the judge, by the way. I'm not going to be the judge here, but I want a I good question, so what do you got? I want to see hands. Uh, how can you measure the trust, or how can you know that the issue in one, uh, UI is a trust and not some other issue. How can you measure that? So, yeah, so there's, I'm trying to separate that into two questions. So, how do we know? Well, one thing that's kind of obvious is that, let's, let's say we have an airline reservation site. And someone goes through several steps to make a reservation. We get just to the point where they need to finish the confirmation, finish, and they don't do it. That's telling us something. So they might be shopping. So shopping people shop all the time, but when we you know, do all the things required to complete the purchase and we don't complete the purchase, that is a very strong suggestion that people are not human confident or trustworthy about what it is. Uh, specifically how to measure, uh, that's a very challenging thing to do. Uh, you know, you, you could try to do it through like customer satisfaction surveys and that sort of thing, but the problem is, uh, there are many things that lead to either satisfaction or dissatisfaction, so it's very hard to be sure about this issue specifically. So what my personal preference is just be aware that it's uh, an issue and try to look for those things that we expect our users to be looking for and make sure we design those in, because if they're not there, we've got a problem with Thank you. Um, do, you, do you have an opposite uh, case? So this, you've shown us a lot of examples where um, trust isn't built, and uh, in you know in a way there's things we perhaps even shouldn't trust because they're so bad. Do you have a case um, or an example where? Um, the trust is fake, so you know it feels like people, you know, I trust right. in that, and I do something, and actually it kind of pulls a little right. uh, a fast one on me, a bait and switch later on. Yeah, exactly. that's kind so of that, almost not worse. We refer to the sorry. Well, that's almost worse than yes, than, yeah. that's true, right? So I refer to those, and other people refer to those as dark patterns. <laughs> and uh, you might be familiar with, I think it's Harry. Is it Harry or Harvey? Harry Brunel, British guy. So he's got a website called yeah, yeah, DarkPatterns.org. Yeah. And also, Evil by Design with Chris Nodder book. Yep. So he gives examples, both, both uh, Chris Nodder and uh, Brunel give examples of situations where they're designed specifically to mislead people, to, let's say, have them do things they don't want to do. So the classic example of that might be writing error, where you accidentally uh, sign up for insurance, travel insurance, when you had no intention whatsoever, just based on which the, the way in which the UI is designed. 
So yes, that's something I'm aware of. Actually, I have a second part to this that addresses that, but given you only 40 minutes, I have to cut that. But it's a very interesting issue because we don't want to like abuse people's trust in order to manipulate them to do things they don't want. Very good. Would you trust me? I read and recommend the book. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, my question was about uh, credibility and, and confidence and how you build the, and that based on competence and many times based on consistency. Consistency, especially in behaviors, you emphasize the principles of, of Google. Do you, can you name any principles that are actually uh, damaging credibility, damaging um, confidence? Ah, so principles that damage confidence? Yeah. Yeah, I might have addressed that in one of the slides, and basically my claim was it was kind of the opposite of those things that build trust. So, you know, having, let's say, control over, over terms would be something that builds trust. Not having control over terms would be something that harms trust. Avoiding surprises would build trust. Being surprised, you've got something you didn't expect, it doesn't build trust. So it, it's kind of the opposite. It's kind of the easiest way of looking at it. I think sometimes when you have too much personalization, too much, uh, maybe you're damaging trust. Even when it's, a, in essence, a good principle, good sanctions, maybe for a certain product. Right. Uh, that level of high personalization is a big control. Right. Yes. Right, exactly. So complexity versus simplicity, transparency versus obscurity is what the rich issues. Definitely. So interesting thing about, you know, I don't know, I haven't looked at Facebook policy lately, but when it was kind of scandalous, it was scandalous because it was very, very complex what they really have. And very much hard to Absolutely. Yes. Uh, why do you think there are so many bad error messages? Do you think it might be because of an engineering mindset that because the user is not following the way the system was supposed to work, every error is the same error, you know, not like small errors. Yeah. So I would, I think there's two obvious explanations. One is that it tends to be programmers that are designing error messages. Right, so they're not really designed from the user experience point of view. So actually, if you look at your typical UI spec, there's not a lot of error messages that's going into it. But the other is, it's kind of history. We've done it this way, we've always done it this way, we kind of consider it acceptable, right? So if we have, you know, terminate, catastrophic error, abort immediately, we look at that and it's like, oh, okay. You know, we accept it when we should, we should have a higher bar for how we write and stuff. But it's just so used to seeing that. Yeah, we're not upset. See Hi. Um, I may go back to the question that was the first question. But, um, you show a lot of principles that said, um, like, trust in, trust in, trust in, that could have been replaced with usability or for usability or usability of, um, right in the, in the beginning of the presentation. Um, and there's a way to measure all that. Um, you also say that. Um, being aware of you know, this issue of trust issue um, should be enough, um, and that basically there's no way to measure this, or that you could measure it with some very broad um, uh, measure. I think it's, I think it's yeah. difficult to measure. Yeah, okay, yes. so um, I'm going to make a very straight question is, is there a way to measure trust? Yeah, very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, I won't take that for an answer right <laughs> Well, you know, again, so we can measure things. We can measure, we have ways of measuring satisfaction, for example. But where does the satisfaction come from? How do we know where it comes from? How do we know specifically that it's trust? Yes, of course, that's hard to know. measure. Uh, but do you know, uh, there's bad ways of measuring trust. I mean, there are like three questionnaires that you don't agree with, but something to point us to, to try and get ourselves. Miss what I get is, uh, okay, there's no way to do it. Um, there should be some way of hearing it, so it's a bad way to do it. Okay, fair enough there. Well, I'll tell you what, let's open the, the uh, question up to Does anyone have any advice that they recommend to anyone who tried to make trust? What about the If you have a life business, uh, you take pretension as a metric? 
uh, people coming back next week, next yes. day, next month, as a proxy of fidelity or of trust in the way they buy? Right. And in fact, I agree with that. So I would say that customer uh, retention is certainly an issue. But to tie the, the dark pattern thing with the retention thing, the interesting thing is, you know, we can do something. The other thing, of course, we measure is, is you know, conversion, profitability, that sort of thing. So let's say we were to do something that's in dark pattern that gets more business, gets more sales, but has a long-term effect of harming customer retention. The problem is, uh, it's easier to measure the short-term results, which is more money. It's harder to measure the long-term results, which is lost customers. So I would recommend customer retention. Absolutely, if you're losing customers, that's telling you something. But the problem is that's kind of a lack of indicator. It takes a while to get that data, and it might be for a change you made months ago. So the problem, although I agree that's a great thing to measure, is there's kind of a lag that's in the Okay. Yes. Um, when a user loves to a class, it's usually it will be really upsetting for him. So I see a lot, for example, of uh, Facebook pages of companies that have like lots of users like complaining for these trust issues, and that nobody cares. Like the answers are just, uh, oh, come back, and maybe we're going to give you a. Uh, something that is uh, a lot of information that uh, I think companies don't recover, like uh, social red, uh, like Facebook and other, other types of this, like they're undervalued, like, all the other things that they're using. Right. Yeah. And so the, the interesting thing again is when you lose your customers, it's very difficult to get through that. You can't lose them. Yes. You've been talking about uh, how to build a virtual city design. Yes. But uh, I think it's a different problem. But it's about trust and confidence. Uh, I've been working on a project that's basically uh, about rebuilding a uh, uh, software that uh, every company has been to implement. And uh, one of the main reasons that uh, this build has been to be uh, it's because uh, users yeah, don't have trust to use uh, software. So, uh, this project started with uh, users in countries that we are capable to, to build something that's worth trust. Uh, how can uh, they have an idea of how to build trust? And the way of conducting our project. Right. So uh, I think I addressed many of them in the, in the deck, but the one I would <coughs> point out specifically is that things that are invisible do not put a trust. So there's a lot to be said for invisibility. If you make it obvious to the user what it is you're doing, and you're stating explicitly that you're going to do this, or giving feedback when you're doing something so it's very, very clear what's going on. That's going to be a whole lot more trustworthy than if we take it for granted and we don't really say those things. Visibility earns trust. And visibility earns it. So I, that would be the first thing I would look for, and I'm willing to beg that in your situation, you probably have that, where you just don't want to do it yet. So just move the audience. It's going to be very, very important. Does that sound good? <laughs> All right. Time, so I you want to work? Everyone wants to. <laughs> okay, ten more minutes. Okay, so my question is related to software. Um, suppose that you create a software, of course, software is uh, sometimes really wrong, you will have bugs, of course, all the time you have bugs. Um, so the users say to you, okay, I pressed these two buttons of the application crash or whatever, so you lost confidence. The user confidence, lost confidence in your software. Is there any technique that when you launch the fix, the patch, 
the Apple for that software that you can apply and say, please trust again with this software that we promise you. Fix the problem, it's not going to happen again. So the exact design that you suggested, it would be a little unusual. But very often when we do have a patch, a new release, update, uh, part of that process is to explain what's new. So I would certainly, again, be very visible in terms of what it is you're trying to, to fix it, make it very, very clear that, hey, we know there's a problem with stability or whatever, and put that at the top so that people see it. And I think that will, you know, you don't have to say, hey, twist is this time, but making those uh, improvements more obvious, I think will help a lot. Minus. It's really, it's really, it's really like that. But sometimes the system, it's, it's part of the system is to fail. I mean, when, when I was working with travel agents, online travel agents, I, I remember that, I remember, I remember that, I remember that we had a problem that when, when we book a ticket, and the user press OK and confirms the, the booking. Actually, it's sending an application for the server. And maybe in the meantime, that process will fail. And sometimes we had we had to get uh, to give bad news to I mean, your application failed. I couldn't be book your ticket right now, but we, we are we are dealing with it. Yes, and I remember in the user testing that there was no way to write a message that will give some satisfaction for the user. The user was always okay. I want to tell you something about that. Okay, I don't really know how to address that specific issue of writing an error message in this case. Again, you know, kind of being recognizing the problem in the world. But the one thing I would like to do, I do talk about forgiveness. So one situation that really bothers me as a user is when uh, your service fails, gives me an error message, and I have to start completely over. So at least if you were to say, okay, we've got, you know, we've got a problem, whatever, try again later, and I don't have to start completely over, the thing that I did is saved, at least as a user, I feel a whole lot better about it. Whereas if by contrast, I get an error message, I go back to the home screen and I have to start completely over it, do everything again, that's the last thing that's going to do. So, if you have a situation where this happens, I would really like to encourage you to design that down so that you keep track and don't start. And so, maybe I'm not throwing the error message, but at least when I go back, I go through that. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, okay. Matt, just something different. Okay. Uh, I was going to say, yes. You were going to say, I'm going to test. Matt, the user is looking at it. So, there are three possible endings. It's okay, you have your ticket. No more things to do. Oh, we can't process your ticket because the server is down. And you've lost everything in the event. And he says, we have your data. You almost have your money, and you have to wait to see if we can get your ticket or not. Yeah. And there was no way to say this in a way that gave any satisfaction because the user had their mind compromised. They didn't know if it was going to be um, charged from the credit card or not, and it was not in their power to revert it. Okay, so it's a very difficult situation. And right. I think it's a very positive. Okay. You got me. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Sorry that when the turn this. So maybe we should actually ask. Maybe that was a problem. I think it's about time to wrap up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I have two more things to do. Yes. Okay. Yeah, after that. Okay, so. Uh, okay, one more. Um, sorry, it's going to be like a space policy question, but I was thinking about the Internet of Things and how everything seems to be controlled right now by a smartphone and applications there. But when we get to a point that devices are going to get smarter and we will need to trust them, processing, and so forth, so it's going to require a lot. Right. Um, 
I would think, and also at the same time, how do we uh, build trust around the person that we've just met, where we decide in a few seconds how we're going to trust that person or not. And so, how do you imagine and how do you picture um, UIs in the next 10 years? And do you think they're going to be more human about sort of things that we um, use from perception and things that we have an important communication to decide where we trust people? Yeah, so, so I, I haven't had a chance to go talk into the internet and things, you know, but, you know, I, I'm going to do a workshop tomorrow where I get some interpret the kind of UI is basically a form of human conversation, right? So what I would recommend is, you know, the, the taking the trust for granted part is where we have a mechanical solution. You know, we need this information from you, you submit the form, you do it, and we don't do anything to build your confidence that we're going to do the right thing. So the human conversation would address like issues like uh, you know, you know, is it safe to do? What do we need to do? And how do we kind of set this up in a secure way? Is it secure? Um, what you know, what do you need to make sure that it behaves the way you expect it to behave? That should be explicitly part of the experience rather than taking it. So what I would think the solution would be to think about that human conversation. What would you talk to the user in person? And make sure that those elements where those issues of trust or confidence, those are addressed in the UI somewhere. That's what I do. I don't know where it would lead, but, but uh, it's, it's more human, less mechanical. Yes. All right, so we have a tough decision to make, so we have to uh, decide who has the best uh, question. Thank you all for your very good questions. Do I have to? Do you have to decide? <laughs> oh, yes. 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 <laughs> Let the public decide. Let the public decide, yeah. That would be a good one. All right. OK. Uh, but we need to make a. Well, I could ask you again. OK. Let's do that. I'm going to go to a random slide. I'm going to ask a question based on this. Ah, OK. What is Everett's law of trust? Who huh? knows? Everett's, Everett's law of trust. Everett's. Trust is. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? So, uh, you were so close. But uh, the gentleman in the background first. So, that was it. So, it is. Uh, it's, it's hard to earn, but easy to lose. And very difficult to regain. Okay, who would be at? Do you have a